Today I'm going to be talking about a topic of intellectuals divorcing God from the real world. And of course, this is, uh, as a historian uh, of ideas, looking at the history of ideas, uh, this is something that's going to go back, to, especially to the 18th century Enlightenment. And I'm going to talk about some of the historical development of this idea uh, of that uh, God is divorced from the real world. In other words, uh, the idea here is that, of course, there's some going to be absent. Some intellectuals over the centuries are going to turn to atheism and deny there's a God at all. But even those that uh, don't deny uh, that there's a possibility of a God will generally be trying to push God out of the real world. In other words, trying to say that, you know, oh yeah, you can talk about God, but he doesn't have anything to do with empirical science, empirical history, and other kinds of things like that. So we're going to see how, how that uh, developed over time. And, you know, this, this problem is really pervasive, and I'm sure you've seen this in the academy, and I've, I've actually called it, talked there also in the subtitle there about the fact value divide. You may Sometimes you've heard it phrased that way, okay, you have facts on the one hand, values on the other, and never the twain shall meet. Okay, in other words, values are completely subjective, and I'll go through this more detail about how this, this breaks down. So you get facts on the one hand, values on the other hand, or science on the one hand, faith on the other hand. So we're going to talk about these kind of dichotomies and how they develop. And I'm sure you've seen this lots in your, uh, in your own work, most likely in your own academic fields very often. But it, it not only affects uh, academics and scholarship at the highest levels, it even it percolates down into a lot of popular culture and such too. And so I have an American example here. Whoops. Oh yeah, here we go. An American example from Newsweek magazine from 2008. The religion editor of Newsweek wrote this in 2008. Reason defines one kind of reality, what we know. Faith defines another, what we don't know. Okay, so they're defining faith as ignorance, essentially. What we don't know, it's ignorance. You know? So faith is just ignorance, you know, things we don't know about. You can, yeah, you can have faith about whatever you want about things we don't know about. But the things we do know about, that's science, that's reality, that's reason, and such. So, so even popular culture sort of has picked up these ideas about the dichotomy that I'm going to be talking about here uh, today. And in fact, uh, one of the more prominent uh, scientists who has sort of laid out a uh, sort of thoroughgoing system of this and even gave it a fancy name is Stephen Jay Gould, the famous paleontologist from Harvard University, who uh, in 1999 wrote a book called Rock of Ages, Science and Religion in the Fullness of Life. And in that book, Stephen Jay Gould lays out a principle that he gave the fancy name of non-overlapping magisteria. And they, sub, they uh, generally, uh, uh, and by magisteria, he's talking about these realms of, of thought thinking. And non-overlapping means that, of course, they're, not, they're totally separate. They're totally distinct and such. And so the, the two magisteria that he's talking about primarily is the ones I'm sketching out, science and religion. He was talking about in his book. So science and religion, you say, are two totally separate fields. They don't overlap. There's no interaction between them. We've got to keep them completely separate. So that's what is non-overlapping magisteria. In fact, they abbreviated this NOMA. So if you ever see NOMA, that's non-overlapping magisteria, okay, the NOMA principle that Stephen Jay Gould laid out. What's interesting, though, is that uh, Gould <coughs> violated his own principle uh, in his book, Wonderful Life, The Burgess Shale and the Nature of History, which came out in 1989, and I don't think he changed his views between 1989 and 99. I don't think that's why the differences are there. But in his book, Wonderful Life, he argues that the reason that we as humans exist is because of some contingent events that took, back, that took place uh, in uh, geologic history uh, that he, and he's talking in this book, Wonderful Life, about the Burgess Shale, and he's looking at these different fossils that were discovered, discovered in the Burgess Shale. And lo and behold, there was this one chordate fossil that was in the Burgess Shale. And he said the fact that this, chord, this particular chordate, this sort of ancient chordate, was able to survive uh, the destruction and decimation that took place for a lot of other uh, extinction that took place for a lot of other things, that, is, that contingent event, that that particular chordate survived, is the reason that we are here today. And he said, if you go back and replay the tape of history, this is how, of course, uh, most of you are actually old enough to remember tapes, but uh, in the, in the, in the, he said, if you go back and replay the tape of history, he said, we wouldn't exist. There'd be something different. 
because it's all based on chance events. There's contingency uh, in historical development over geologic time. So he argued that, <clears throat> okay, there's this historical contingency. That's sort of the main point that he's making in this book is about how the, everything is uh, the product of chance events and, and it's all contingent. However, then very interestingly, right at the end of the book, he does start making some claims uh, that build philosophically upon this notion of there being, this is all just chance events. So he says at the end of the book that we have the freedom to choose whatever path we want to take in life. Well, that's a moral position. Wait a minute, I thought morality was part of religion and on you know, the non-overlapping magisteria, morality was supposed to be on the religion side. You know, but here science is making claims that he claims about contingency of history, which has, by the way, some deep philosophical uh, 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 ramifications as well. Uh, but then when he talks about morality as well, he's, you know, he's crossing the line. And what I would uh, present before I get into sort of cut, showing that uh, uh, even more is that uh, contra this position of non-overlapping magisteria, the biblical worldview presents God as being active in nature. And the Enlightenment, was the Enlightenment from the 18th century and then on up into the, the, these rationalists today are trying to undermine the idea that God is active in nature, that God plays any kind of role with nature. So I'm just going to give you one example. I mean, we could go through Scripture and give all sorts of examples out of Scripture. But in 1 Kings 8, 35 and following, it says, When the heavens are shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against you, when they pray toward this place and confess your name and turn from their sin because you afflict them, then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people Israel, that you may teach them the good way in which they should walk and send rain on your land, which you have given to your people as an inheritance. And then immediately after that, so this is a prayer of Solomon. Solomon is praying at this point, the dedication of the temple. And right after that, Solomon then goes on to mention famine, Pestilence, blight, mildew, locusts, enemies besieging them, and sickness that could come upon Israel as a result of their moral failures and their sins. So here we have God actively intervening in nature. But if you would suggest to most intellectuals today that God has anything to do with the rain, you know, that's, that's a category mistake. Okay? God doesn't have anything to do with the rain. God doesn't have anything to do with famine. God, this, this is all this all produced naturalistically, okay? And so that's what we're sort of confronting here. Now, um, here's a let's look at how this dichotomy then plays itself out uh, before I talk about the uh, history of how it's uh, come to be. But here's sort of the the way this dichotomy spins it, spins out as we confront it. So you have science on the one hand, and then religion and ethics on the other. And again, Gould would have separated those into the non-overlapping magisteria. So science is investigating nature. And by the way, I'm going to say to you, there's nothing necessarily wrong with making distinctions between science and religion and ethics, uh, as long as we're understanding that there is not some impermeable divide between them that they can't interact in any kinds of way uh, at all. So science is the study of nature, and that's fine. Science is the study of nature, okay? Religion and ethics, study of God and morality. Okay, there's nothing pernicious about that, you know, is sort of dividing up uh, disciplines. No, no problem with that. Uh, science is rational, so it's what gives us knowledge. Religion and ethics uh, in this dichotomy is seen as irrational. It's based on faith, and faith is usually not taken to have any kind of rational component to it in the way that this is being interpreted uh, by these intellectuals. It's based on faith or will or feelings. Okay, uh, Here's another part of the dichotomy as we go down. So uh, science is telling us about facts, and religion and morality is telling us about values. Science is objective, right? Science gives us objective truth and knowledge, whereas religion and morality, that's subjective. That's just coming out of your internal, of your person. I guess it's, it's completely subjective. Science is talking about reality and knowledge. Religion and ethics is about myths and fairy tales. They may not always phrase it that way, but that's essentially what the, the upshot of it is, okay? That there's no uh, empirical reality to the stories that religion tells or that morality is telling us either. 
Uh, science is unitary universal. That is, applies everywhere to everyone. So if you do science in you know, one country or culture, it should be the same as the science in another culture or place. Uh, however, religion and ethics uh, is pluralistic. That is, there's all sorts of different ways of conceiving of religion or conceiving of ethics. And so there's no sense in which we should necessarily agree on those things. You know, we can all have our own views about religion and ethics, and that's fine. You know, there's, nothing, there's, there's no one view of religion and ethics. Now, that may be true, by the way, empirically, that there is no one view of religion and ethics if we survey what's going on in humanity. But, of course, they're saying that is, in principle, how it is. And obviously, as Christians, we don't agree with that in principle, there is, it's pluralistic. In science, you have agreement. That is, we should agree among all ourselves as to what is scientific. But in religion and ethics, we can have all sorts of disagreements because of this pluralism there. Okay, so that sort of uh, looks at the way that, well, I think I have one more there. Yeah, one more category here. Intolerance versus tolerance. Now, this is interesting. It might be reversed from the way you might think I would put it there. Uh, but <clears throat> science is intolerant of those that don't agree with their scientific perspective because it's supposed to be unitary. It's supposed to be universal. You're supposed to agree. You know, if we tell you that something is scientific and you disagree, then you are an ignoramus. <laughs> you know, you just don't get it. You know, so there, there's a sense that which there's this intolerance coming from science if anyone t would dare to, you know, suggest something different, you know, than what their scientific uh, perspective says. Whereas religion and ethics in this construct should be tolerant of anything. You know, and, and again, uh, they're not saying that religion is always tolerant. But the point is that it should be tolerant because there's no way, because everyone's faith, will, and feelings is just as good as anyone else's. You know, everyone's subjective feelings, myths and fairy tales are just as good as anyone else's. You know, so there's no way in which you can make a claim, you know, that yours is superior, better, or whatever else. So, you know, religion and ethics, we should be tolerant of everyone, whatever kind of position anyone takes, and not, you know, be critical of any kind of other kind of perspective about that. So the point of this dichotomy, it seems to me, in thinking about how it came out of the Enlightenment period of the 18th century and then how it's been built since that time, the point of this uh, dichotomy is to keep God out of natural reality, divorced from reality, uh, to deny any kind of supernatural activity and usually this will, there is a denial of miracles in here that's implicit because a miracle obviously is God breaking through into the natural world. So this implies no miracles. It implies that nothing miraculous can ever happen. So because you know, science is completely separate, you know, God and morality is a completely separate category. He can't intervene in nature. You know, these got to be kept completely separate. So this is, uh, so the promotion of sort of a non- uh, uh, supernaturalist worldview sort of goes hand in hand with this, this dichotomy here, sort of what's sort of driving really this dichotomy here. And so in the Enlightenment period, what we find is that you, you do find in the Enlightenment period uh, a strong rejection of any kind of supernatural intervention of God uh, in the world. And so, you know, the famous Enlightenment figures like Voltaire and such, uh, they were very staunchly against the idea that God would have intervened. And they, they did actually believe, many of them did believe that there was a God but they believe he didn't do anything in nature. In fact, one of my philosophy professors when I was an undergraduate said that this was the, that the deists of the Enlightenment period, that their doctrine was basically an unemployed God. You know, so, yeah, you allow their God to be there. He did something in the, in the beginning. You know, he, he, he initiated things, but then he just let it run on his own, and he didn't do anything after that. And so they're trying this. This dichotomy sort of reinforces that notion of there not being a supernatural. No miracles can happen because uh, science and history are on this side. And by the way, history goes on this side too very often. Okay, so historical, empirical history goes here as well. And uh, religion and God and ethics are on this side over here. So religion then can't make any, according to this kind of dichotomy, religion cannot make any kind of objective truth claims. Right? So any, truth, any claim that you make based on religion or ethics is subjective. It's not objective, it's, and it can't be then uh, an objective truth. However, it's interesting that 
Uh, many scientists, even those who claim to uh, adhere to these, this kind of dichotomy and such, very often do try to make truth claims about religion and morality, interestingly. And here's a, an interesting uh, uh, cartoon I came across in a review. I actually put this, this is actually in my book, Death of Humanity, to this cartoon showing you have a, a clergyman here talking with a scientist. And so the scientist says, science and religion are non-overlapping magisteria. So there's Stephen Jay Gould's idea, right, about the non-overlapping non magisteria there. So science and religion are non-overlapping magisteria. And the, the clergyman comes along, and, and this is characteristic of a lot of mainline clergy, a lot of, you know, certainly on the liberal side of the theology, they'll say, yeah, that's right. So he says, yeah, that's right, and each can discover truth. You know, so we'll just keep our compartments separate and discover truth in our own way. And so the scientist goes on to say that that means science shouldn't comment on religious myths and legends. And religious people should leave the science to us and trust our answers. And so here you get the fact that, okay, science is now claiming that we have a monopoly on knowledge. Okay, what you guys are saying is not, you know, it's just myths and legends. And then the uh, clergyman says, but, and then the scientist says, okay, now that we've got that clear, I'm, I'm going to talk about the evolution of religion and moral values. <laughs> so what, ha what starts out with is saying, oh, we're going to have this non-overlapping magisteria, ends up with science monopolizing, you know, the, the claims of truth and the uh, claims of anything that would be knowledge. And then the guy said, that's not, remember, I do the science. <laughs> you know, so science basically takes over the whole field and basically tries to eliminate all the other competition. So these are sort of the kinds of ways. And, and of course, if you know anything about the way that uh, uh, secular thinkers have uh, made arguments about these issues of the evolution of religion and morality, which he's talking about here in this uh, cartoon, uh, you'll recognize that, yeah, they do make all sorts of, there are lots of truth claims that science is making about uh, morality and about religion and such that are fundamentally incompatible with various religious views, including Christianity. So, for example, E.O. Wilson, Edward O. Wilson, Harvard biologist who founded sociobiology back in the 1970s, he's a, an entomologist, uh, and he was studying social instincts. And he began to apply his, he tried to figure out how these social instincts could have evolved and such, and then he began applying those ideas to human evolution as well, and think about the evolution of human morality and such. And so he's written a, a good, he's written a whole book on human nature, for example, uh, and many other uh, works popularizing his ideas about sociobiology. But he and Michael Roos, who's a philosopher of science, a pr prominent philosopher of science, said this about ethics in thinking about their spin on evolutionary ethics, that ethics as we understand it is an illusion fobbed off on us by our genes to get us to cooperate. Okay, so here's a, a claim that is being made, and this is not all that unusual actually. There's lots of evolutionary ethicists out there, lots of people promoting evolutionary ethics, and I've done a good deal of research of the history behind evolutionary ethics. It goes all the way back to Darwin himself. Uh, Darwin himself was uh, promoting the idea that ethics had evolved over time, and that's where we get uh, mor human morality. Uh, but they're making this truth claim about ethics, and ethics is an illusion. You know, so again, they put it on that side of the dichotomy that's a subjective, it's all subjective and everything too, but they're making a truth claim about that, uh, claiming it being subjective, an illusion that's fobbed off on us by our genes to get us to cooperate. So that's the, the basic way that uh, many, at least some, obviously there's a lot of debate over the issue of evolutionary ethics and evolutionary psychology and such, so I'm not trying to imply that all academics believe that, they don't. Uh, but that's just one example of the way that uh, they tend to monopolize the conversation over religion and ethics once they have, uh, cl even while claiming that they're trying to keep them compartmentalized. Okay, let me look back historically now and, and talk a little bit about how this developed because I think this is very interesting. It can help give us some insight into uh, how this uh, has developed over time and then how it's been applied in, the, uh, in scholarship or in the academy. I already mentioned that this the process sort of begins in the Enlightenment period in the 18th century uh, when uh, thinkers began to marginalize God and religion and claimed that religion uh, is the sole arbiter of truth. Uh, excuse me, claimed reason rather, excuse me, claimed that reason was the sole arbiter of truth. So that reason was the watchword of the Enlightenment. Okay, Enlightenment rationalism, the idea that reason is the only way to find knowledge. 
and they generally were bashing Christianity and religion, calling it superstition. And they're the ones, actually, the, the Enlightenment thinkers were the ones who coined the term Dark Ages. That word didn't exist before the Enlightenment period. And, and it was Dark Ages because they were the Enlightenment. And that word was not just used by historians after the time. That was used by people during that period to describe their own uh, beliefs. They, they thought they were the Enlightened ones. And in fact, Immanuel Kant, whom I'm going to talk about here in just a little bit too, Immanuel Kant, who's one of the later Enlightenment thinkers, uh, he was going to write a famous essay called What is Enlightenment? And so they were using this term themselves, Enlightenment, and everything preceding them was the Dark Ages uh, that they now were coming, and because of, they were now rediscovering reason, and they believe that was contrary to religion that they thought, saw as superstitious. So what do they mean by reason? Because that word can be used in a lot of different ways. Well, for them, they thought that reason was, sci was patterned after scientific inquiry. And they were definitely disciples of the scientific revolution. Although they were going to dismiss the theistic views of Newton and others, but they really liked the idea of scientific inquiry, and that sort of became the, the uh, pattern for what they saw as reason, so empirical inquiry, studying things empirically, and they were going to disparage anything that has to do with the supernatural or faith or miracles or anything like that. And so they're going to start creating this, this distinction then between a faith and reason. <clears throat> Most of them during the Enlightenment period still did believe in God, and so they embraced more a deistic perspective, uh, although some did move completely toward uh, an atheistic perspective. Uh, uh, Julien Delamatry uh, was a prominent uh, mid-18th century French materialist thinker. He wrote a book in 1747 called Man the Machine. Man the Machine. So we're just a machine. You know, there's nothing uh, mysterious about humanity. There's no separate soul. You know, we're just uh, a machine, and if we could just understand, study scientifically, and understand all the causation plugged into it, then we'd understand all the outputs too. And so that's how they were conceiving humanity there. So, and Diderot, and there were some others too that embraced uh, 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 atheism completely. And David Hume, the British empiricist, he never, he never. Uh, publicly espoused atheism, although many suspect he was an atheist. He certainly was a skeptic, that's very clear. Uh, we're not exactly sure if he was an atheist, but if he wasn't, he was pretty close uh, to it. Uh, but many of them, even if they did accept that there was a God, they l wanted to limit his activity, and many of them uh, would limit his activity to just an initial creation event, okay? and then everything else would spin out after that. So the, the famous watchmaker hypothesis, right, of William Paley. God creates this perfect watch, and because he's a perfect creator, he doesn't have to intervene later on. He can just let it run. And they even saw miracles as, as being a, sort of a foolish construct because it's the idea that, well, couldn't God create it perfect enough at the start that he didn't have to tinker with it later? You know, why does he have to tinker around with it later? Why does he have to fix the watch? You know, why didn't he, he create a watch that's perfectly run, that's just perfectly run, he just winds it up and it goes. So miracles are, they saw as sort of illegitimate, uh, and they saw it as that actually demoting God from his perfection is the way they actually construed uh, this thinking about God. So what, what happens then is that the God that they believe in is not, no longer a personal God who's interacting with nature and with, even with humanity, but is an impersonal God who just created the world and just lets everything run on itself. In fact, Immanuel Kant had this saying about the di distinction uh, and over deism, and Kant said, the deist believes in a god, the theist in a living god. So that was how Kant drew the distinction. Okay, so if you believe in a living god, then you're a theist. And, and Kant rejected that, but he said a deist still does believe in a god. And in fact, Kant was going to be a very pivotal figure in creating this dichotomy that I laid out to you, uh, creating this notion of the fact value a distinction in a, in a very clear way. And in the second edition to his Critique of Pure Reason, which was one of his fundamental works uh, in looking at epistemology, the, the uh, er, philosophy of knowledge, he said this, and I think I have this up on a slide here, yeah. He said, I have therefore found it necessary to deny knowledge in order to make room for faith. I have to deny knowledge 
in order to make room for faith. And so here he's drawing that, that dichotomy that I've already looked at. Knowledge on the one hand, faith on the other hand. Uh, and they're very distinct in Kant's own uh, thinking about uh, these kinds of things. And Kant was going to, uh, in his critique of pure reason, was going to make a kind of a, a radical uh, change in the way that people thought philosophically about the mind. Because he was going to be, he was going to, he came from a, a rationalist, uh, a continental, I'm going to use rationalism in a different way. He came from a continental rationalist uh, background in his philosophy that was building upon Descartes and Leibniz and other of these uh, philosophers that believe that you start off and sort of use deduction to you know, find truth. But then he was perplexed by David Hume. And he, he said actually, he, he used this, Kant claimed that he, was, he awoke from his dogmatic slumber by reading Hume. And so he's trying to figure, and Hume was a radical empiricist. And so Kant was trying to figure out a way to, to deal with the issues of deduction and rationalism on the one hand, continental rationalism and empiricism and how to, how to square those two things together. And so what he ended up doing is he ended up construing the mind as being active in organizing data, sensory data. So when you think, you know, so Hume saw the mind as basically passive. Hume and other British empiricists thought when you're seeing and hearing and you know, sensing other things with your sense experience, the mind is just passive. It just collects that data and then just maybe organize, maybe organize it in the right word, but it just uh, you know, compiles it in some kind of way, and then you, it, but it's passive. It doesn't create any kind of knowledge. Kant believed that the mind was active in the way that it dealt with sensory data in specific kinds of ways. And so he thought that uh, the, the mind was, when we see things out there, that our mind is acting as a construct through which we see it. So maybe a good way to illustrate this is to, to say that he thought that we were always seeing through certain kinds of glasses, so to speak. You know, you've got, the, you know, you've got your glasses on, you're always seeing things in a certain kind of way because your mind portrays it that way. So let me give you one example, okay? Space. Kant claimed there's no such thing as absolute space. Space doesn't exist except here. Space exists here, not out there. When I'm seeing space out here, when I see space and things in the spatial construct, that's not because there is actually space out there. It's because that's how my mind organizes empirical data. Same thing with time. He said time doesn't exist out there. Time exists in here. Your mind uh, organizes things based on time. And he thought that these were universal. He thought that everyone's mind, unless you're you know, insane or something, you know, that everyone's mind pretty much organizes data in the same way. So you know, we, we all understand and can communicate about time and space and these things like that because we all have minds that process the data in this kind of way. So this was going to be actually a revolutionary way of thinking. And, and historians of philosophy really do see Kant as being a pivotal pioneer figure. And after Kant, uh, pretty much the next couple of centuries of philosophy was people responding to Kant, maybe trying to take him in one direction or another. Not that they all were Kantians. Many of them rejected elements of Kantian philosophy. But they were wrestling with Kant, and they were trying to figure out how to make sense of Kant's understanding of mind. Uh, and again, they could move in different directions with it. But let's look here at how this is going to work itself out in Kant's way of thinking about uh, the uh, cosmos. And, dividing the, realm, the world into different realms uh, epistemologically. Now, first of all, I need to be careful with this word dualism here because there's different kinds of dualism, and some kinds are good, and some kinds are not good in terms of philosophically. Uh, and in fact, the word dualism gets bandied about a good deal, and I've, I've had a lot of discussions with people about even body-soul dualism and such. There's some people that are, don't, aren't comfortable with that term, but here I'm talking I'm not talking about body-soul dualism here. I'm not talking about anthropological dualism. I'm talking about epistemological dualism. So this is a dualism in thought, the way that we think about things. This is a dualism of knowledge. And I'm not saying that makes it good or right. In fact, I don't agree. I mean, obviously, I'm trying to undercut this dualism here uh, in my whole talk. Uh, so I do think that there's something pernicious about this kind of dualism. But I want to be clear that there's different 
forms of dualisms, and some are not necessarily pernicious. So Kant divided the, the knowledge into two different kinds of knowledge. And he called this the phenomenal realm on the one hand and the noumenal realm on the other hand. And the word noumenal uh, comes from the Greek word for mind. And so this is the side of mind. This is the side of empirical reality, the, the, the world out there. And so uh, this is the phenomenal realm is the perceived world, the empirical world, the, the world that we can sense, that we have sense experiences about. The noumenal realm is the things in themselves, the way things actually exist, which we don't really have complete access to, right? We only have access to them through our sense experience. So we don't have complete access to these things in themselves that Kant says nonetheless are existing apart, that can be different and distinct from our knowledge of the perceived world. So the phenomenal realm is things like nature. The noumenal realm has things in it like God. And Kant did believe in God. He was a deist. Uh, so he did believe the noumenal realm had God. <clears throat> and the phenomenal realm is the realm of natural laws. So this is where we can do science. Science is all in the phenomenal realm. It's, the phenomenal realm is deterministic. Okay? So that means that it's all about natural causation. And so the phenomenal realm is uh, we can study through science and, and discover those things through science. In the noumenal realm, we have free will. And by the way, free will throws off science, right? <laughs> if you're trying to study science and your subject of your science has free will, then your science is not going to work. And that's why, by the way, when we get to the like, 19th century, when uh, Francis Galton, the famous uh, pioneer of eugenics, coined the phrase nature versus nurture, and sort of and began engaging this debate in the late 19th century. You'll still hear this, by the way, all the time. You know, nature versus nurture. You know, well, wait a minute. Are those the only two options? If free will exists, there's actually another option between nature and nurture. There's something other than nature and nurture. Uh, but Kant was going to constrain. Was going to believe that free will was going to be only in the noumenal realm. So again, distinct from science and natural laws, which is true, uh, but uh, it doesn't mean that uh, the free will can't interact with the other things, which we're going to see. Okay, so here's where you do science, and here's where you have religion. The phenomenal realm is temporary, you know, as long as this world exists and such. And Kant, interestingly, as a deist, did believe that there would be some afterlife as well. In uh, the noumenal realm, he thought there was immortality. In fact, in, in these three things here, by the way, God, free will, and immortality, those were three of the things that he specifically said were part of the noumenal realm and part of the things that we could not gain through uh, pure reason, but that we could gain through what he calls practical reason, which he's going to write about later in his books. And so that's, in fact, the next thing here. The phenomenal realm is accessible to pure reason. So when he wrote his famous critique of pure reason, he thought that what you're actually examining there is things in the phenomenal realm. So what this means is that we can't at get scientific, empirical knowledge, pure reason knowledge about these things, God, free will, and, or religion, immortality. Those are things outside of our ability through pure reason to understand or get knowledge about. The problem for Kant is that he says we can't know anything about these things on the right here uh, the, the, in the noumenal realm. Uh, we can only know about these things in the phenomenal realm. And in one sense, that's right. But then, of course, he does go on to write his critique of practical reason, where he does try to say that we can know about these things through practical reason. So through pure, what he calls pure reason, we can't know about those things on the right. Kant would say through pure reason, we can't know these things at all. But then he goes on in his critique of practical reason to make the claim that we can know about uh, these things because of the existence of morality. But then that's, that's predicated upon this, this uh, understanding that morality exists, and therefore he thought he could reason to then the existence of God uh, and uh, religion and immortality and such. I was talking with a Kantian scholar one time who I was trying to make sure I understood these things right about uh, Kant, and, and uh, I was talking about that issue of the practical reason, though, and my understanding is that when Kant is dealing with the, the practical reason, trying to understand you know, the existence of God and such, he, he doesn't really prove the existence of God. What he proves is that we have to believe in the existence of God. 
<laughs> so he only, he's, it's an epistemological point. He's proving that we as humans, because of the way our, because of our, uh, the way our minds are constructed and because of our moral, uh, because of our morality, so we have to believe in the existence of God. He doesn't actually prove that God really does exist. And the Kant scholar told me, yeah, that's right. You know, <laughs> that's exactly the way it, way it turns out. So. But there were two main ways that philosophies tried to deal with uh, in, in the post-Kantian era. One way was to try to get knowledge about the noumenal realm, and this is where the Romantic movement came in, in the 1790s and the early 1800s. Uh, the Romantic movement was a movement primarily within the arts, poetry, uh, painting, uh, and such, <clears throat> that tried to get direct access to this uh, to the knowledge about God and free will and religion and immortality uh, and such uh, by believing that science was trivial, that these things over here are just trivial, and this is really where it's important. And so they tried to get sort of direct access through either uh, through their feelings, a lot of times it was subjective through feelings or the kinds of things. Schleiermacher, the famous German theologian, was going to uh, say that, uh, you know, rely on feelings, you know, as being the... the touchstone for how to get knowledge about God and such. That's how you get knowledge about religion. He was part of the Romantic movement. Uh, and and uh, the Romantics were going to basically have an irrationalist bent, and they were going to reject Enlightenment rationalism. So they're going to be looking at things like will, emotion, uh, as ways of getting knowledge. When I say irrationalism, I'm using this in a technical sense, by the way. I'm not using this as you know insane or crazy or something. I'm, I'm talking about people that rely on will or uh, emotion or other kinds of subjective ways of getting knowledge and believe that's the path to knowledge. So feelings or faith, that's sort of part of that irrationalism of romanticism. Romantics tended to uh, promote religion, not always Christianity though, sometimes uh, there's a lot of pantheism uh, in the Romantic movement uh, in the 1790s, especially in the very earliest phases of the Romantic movement, but other people coming out of Romanticism too uh, were going to uh, embrace uh, pantheism too, but some did move to more uh, Christian forms, uh, sometimes Catholicism. Uh, Chateaubriand in uh, France was an example of that who uh, embraced Catholicism. Uh, belief in metaphysics, uh, usually the fine arts were the way, main way that they were trying to promote their ideas through painting, poet poetry especially. William Blake in England, for example, is a good example of that. They saw nature as being beautiful. They focused on the aesthetic side of nature not the mechanistic side. They're rejecting the Newtonian mechanistic model of nature. They're saying it's, it's all about nature being beauty, and they believed in free will. So that's, again, they're trying to break away from the scientific viewpoint of the Enlightenment and the primacy of mind rather than matter. And so here's just one example. We don't have time to go to a lot of examples. This is a, a German painter, uh, David Caspar Friedrich, uh, and you can see the centrality of religious uh, image there with the, the steeple of the church there, and uh, you have this notion of sort of death at the bottom with these dead bushes and everything, but then you have these sort of the symbols of everlasting life stretching up to the sky, and you have the light here, the darkness down here, light here, crucifix, Jesus in the center sort of pointing upward with the steeple uh, there. So this is a typical kind of example of kind of romantic kind of thinking that did bring primacy toward religion and, and feelings uh, and such. But there was another way that, uh, there was an opposite kind of way that uh, people took Kant, and that was to focus on the phenomenal realm and just dismiss the noumenal realm altogether. And these were the positivist uh, movement, which uh, is equivalent to what later became known as agnosticism, agnosticism in a, in a uh, a hard sense, not the soft agnosticism. This is the, this is the notion that, that uh, the only knowledge we have is scientific knowledge. The only kind of knowledge we have is what we can get empirically uh, through our sense experience and such. And so uh, the positivists were arch rationalists. They believed in reason. Uh, they focused on science as the path to knowledge. Uh, they, uh, the word agnosticism, by the way, only came about in the middle of the 19th century. And the word agnosticism, when it was first coined, did not mean, as it sometimes today might mean, just, oh, I just really don't know, and maybe you don't even care. Uh, maybe you know something about God or whatever, but I don't. When the word agnosticism was first coined, it, it really meant, like the positivists believed before the, the word came about, that I don't believe in God, uh, excuse me, that 
I don't know if there's a God or not, and neither do you, and neither does anyone else, because it's in principle impossible to know whether there's a God or not. So it's denying that there's even the possibility of knowledge about God. And that's what positivists uh, believe, that anything, any statement about God they believe is totally outside the realm of our ability to understand or have knowledge about it. So they're focusing on uh, laboratory science, <clears throat> machines, uh, rather than the fine arts. They see nature as a mechanism. They want, they want mechanistic, mechanistic explanations for, uh, science, for nature rather than seeing the aesthetic side of nature. Uh, they're deterministic. They believe everything has to be explain, explicable by scientific means, including humanity. Humans have to be explained through scientific laws and scientific causation as well. And then the primacy of matter. Uh, so uh, many people on that side. Positivists uh, in technically are not atheists uh, because an atheist denies that there is a God and the positivist would say we can't know whether there's a God or not. So there's some distinction there, but, there are, but when they get to their interpretations of humanity, it's pretty much the same thing <laughs> because they both believe the only way to interpret things is through scientific knowledge and empirical, uh, empirical construct with that. So uh, let's look at then real quickly, I'm just about done here. Uh, look at real quickly how this has impacted contemporary philosophy. So in contemporary philosophy, you have two main branches uh, of contemporary philosophy uh, in the academy. Uh, you have analytic and you have continental. The analytic is much stronger in the Anglo-American tradition. Uh, in uh, the United States, the vast majority of universities, especially research universities, are dominated by the analytic tradition. Uh, the continental tradition, as the name suggests, is more dominant in the continental Europe. Uh, in <clears throat> Germany, France, uh, other countries on the continent being uh, uh, very uh, primary there. And sort of you see the breakdown here, which is very similar to the breakdown that we just looked at between uh, the <clears throat> romantics and the, uh, and the uh, uh, positivists, although I actually switched the side. I probably should have switched the columns because I actually I, the analytic would be on the right and the continent on the left. We were doing the same columns with the romantic. Sorry, I should have switched that around there. But in any case, analytic philosophy uh, today uh, tends to be rationalist, use logic, focuses on science, and is very modernist. Was the word modernist is used. Uh, and the continental philosophy tends to be irrationalist, focusing on getting knowledge through will. And here when we're talking about continental philosophy, we're thinking about uh, especially many of those who've built upon Nietzschean philosophy, such as Heidegger, uh, Sartre, uh, and then more recently, uh, people who fit in the sort of postmodernist kind of category, like Foucault and Derrida, and some of the very prominent uh, philosophers who come out of the continental kind of tradition. A lot of them uh, use literature and the arts to try to convey their ideas. I mean, think of Jean-Paul Sartre writing plays, writing novels, and other kinds of things to convey his ideas about life being absurd and other kinds of things like that, and, and uh, didn't believe that, believe that knowledge was something that we construct, not something that we uh, you know, sort of discover. And that's sort of the key, one of the key ideas in the continental philosophy, that knowledge is something we construct and that we either design individually, if you go like with Nietzsche particularly, or perhaps it's a social construct. That's a more bigger one in the postmodernist kind of thinking, that knowledge is just a social construct there. And so this is how then this uh, has played itself out today in philosophy. Okay, to conclude then, it seems to me that this bifurcation of reality that we've sort of sketched out here has largely been driven by an anti-supernaturalist worldview. The idea that we now to get God's activity out of the world, uh, relegate God's activity to just the realm of the subjective, personal feelings, uh, and so it doesn't have anything to do with any kind of objective, uh, empirical kind of reality. And, and as Christians, I think we need to confront that bifurcation of reality because for us, God and, God and morality are not just subjective constructs, they are real. You know? So they're the, this bifurcation of reality sort of can, pushes God into unreality, myth, legend, superstition, and such. And so we as Christians need to confront that bifurcation of reality and, and understand when we're seeing these uh, dichotomies being spun out, uh, how they're trying to sort of separate God out from the real world.
Okay, the question was about uh, the, the, this uh, dichotomy they have here between analytic and continental, and some people are trying to, to uh, blend the two or trying to bring the two together in certain ways. I think that's been true throughout all of intellectual history. You have people trying to blend different sides of ideas. And so, yeah, I do think that kind of thing goes on. But I think what's interesting, though, is that uh, the continental philosophy in particular, and what we often sometimes refer to as postmodernist philosophy, uh, does actually want to blur boundaries altogether. And so uh, postmodernism doesn't even like there to be clear distinctions between things. I mean, if you go back even to Nietzsche, you know, who's a, a big influence, of course, on continental philosophy and the development of Heidegger and Sartre and the postmodernist things. I mean, Foucault was very involved, in, was very Nietzschean in some of his approach. Uh, Nietzsche didn't want to lay out a system of thought. He wanted to break down boundaries. He wanted to uh, sort of throw out things. And, and Foucault himself, uh, one of the most prominent late 20th century philosophers uh, from France, Foucault actually said that his, his own works he compared at one point to bombs. He said they not only are destructive of you know, other ideas or whatever, and, and social constructs and such, but they destroy themselves in the process. And so, so he would, you know, one work, he might write one work in which he's actually, you know, taking positions that are contrary to positions that he's taken in earlier works, and he thinks that's, and he doesn't see that as, as being problematic in terms of contradiction, because contradiction is just part of philosophy, according to this way of thinking. There's no problem with contradiction. You know, contradictions are not a problem. So they're trying to blur the boundaries anyway in all sorts of ways. How, how far can we accept science and how much do we need to, to accept science? Well, I think the, the, the model is going to be, is going to have to integrate uh, what we know from everything we know about life, not just what we know from, say, uh, the laboratory. And in fact, you know, you think about scientists, they actually do this in a lot of ways. And, and think about how far we can go in, in, in uh, you know, accepting science. There's a, some kinds of science are based on laboratory experiments that are repeatable and such, and they tell us what natural laws are. So in that kind of a model, experimental science, lab science, you know, we as Christians can engage in that, of course. We can uh, test. You know, those theories too, by the way, there's actually a lot of, there's a, what's referred to sometimes a replication crisis going on right now in some sciences, uh, and it, it's not, and psychology is one of the worst. Uh, replication crisis, I mean that they have difficulty replicating experiments. Even some that have been very prominent textbook examples of psychology, they're now finding out that they can't replicate their experiments, that, that they, they, they just don't work when they try to replicate them. And this is, by the way, not just going on within psychology. It's actually going on within even physics and some other uh, disciplines, too. And the, publish, the publisher perish mentality is sort of driving a lot of science today in, in ways that shouldn't make us ultra skeptical, maybe. But you know, we need to be careful in just accepting everything, even experimental science. You know, can it be replicated? How, you know, how, how solid is it? But there's other kinds of science that is building on all sorts of uh, presuppositions that are fundamentally contrary to uh, Christianity, the way Christians understand what humanity is, and especially when you get in the human sciences, especially when you get in the psychology, sociology, things like that, because they, they're start, many psychologists and sociologists are starting off from a fundamental presupposition that there is no such thing as free will, and so we should be able to explain everything based on either environment or biology or some combination of the two. Uh, so, I think that a Christian approach and model is going to have to ex explain that if we're looking at human in the human sciences or humanity, we have to be able to look at, okay, biology is important. We need to look at what the biological, uh, in, uh, what biological influences are on human behavior. There are biological influences on human behavior. behavior. There are environmental influences on human behavior. You know, our, our upbringing, our education, they do matter. But there's also free will. And then there's also... God in the equation, too, at some point. So somehow, and, and I, I haven't really got a, a well thought out, you know, detailed thing to lay out uh, that, that would be like a model in the terms that you, what you're thinking of, but I do think that we need to incorporate, we need to incorporate all of those ideas together uh, to try, if we're going to try to come up with a Christian model of what it's going to look like 
uh, to practice science or to do other kinds of scholarly endeavors, not just science, but other kind of scholarly endeavors uh, as well. We need to incorporate all of those insights uh, together.